Hello, everyone. This is Glenn Hodges. Welcome to Chattanooga Self-Improvement Meetup, a mastermind group where we listen, learn, ask questions, and comment in an effort to help make each other the best version of our speaker today is uh, Tom Glenn, who is the president of Elders Ace Hardware. Uh, they have 22 neighborhood hardware stores in East Tennessee and North Georgia. Tom joined the Elders Arts Ace Hardware in 1987. Previously, he was a senior consultant with Arthur Anderson. He's the past chairman of the Chattanooga Chamber of Commerce, where I was where I first heard him speak. And boy, did he do an, off, an awesome job. Uh, he serves on the boards of the Generosity Trust and Bibles in the Schools since 2013. He earned a BBA from the Harvard of the South, Deborah Levine, at the University of Georgia, and an MBA from Duke University, Fuqua School of Business. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, Tom, and today we're, we're going to learn a little bit about lessons in life and business from a real pro. Take it away, Tom. It's all yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Glenn. I, I appreciate that. And Kelly, uh, thank you all for inviting me to come and, and share a few thoughts today. Uh, you know, uh, and, and it, it just kind of reinforced me, reinforced for me through the introductions. One of the things I had a little bit of a hard time getting a handle on was, okay, I, I know one of the principles of sharing with the group is to understand the group. And I had a hard time getting my arms around, like, what is this group? Uh, but I, I tried to, uh, I couldn't get my arms around exactly what should I share with this group? So I kind of turned it back on Glenn and I said, how about just giving me some questions? Like, is there something this group might be interested in? So, so I appreciate very much, Glenn, you kind of just submitting to me uh, several questions. And uh, Glenn, Glenn submitted nine questions, but then he told me I'll probably end up answering two or three based on time. So I have actually, Glenn, I've selected just a, a two or three to talk about. Um, so I, I should start by saying this, and that is to the extent our company or me personally have had any success, I think it's, uh, it's we can strictly attribute that to God's blessing. And I, I, I am often reminded of, um, you know, that we are so fortunate to be in this industry, the hardware retailing industry, because I think about some of our friends uh, who are in other industries like the bookstore business, or maybe with this past year being in the restaurant business, the hotel business. I mean, so many businesses, even with exceptional leaders and exceptional teams, they still uh, struggled mightily and maybe not even succeeded. So, and I, I, one other thing, I, a caveat that I wanna give to this group, and that is that uh, I feel like uh, in sharing that a lot of things that I say will come across as cliche. I, I, don't, I don't have anything super creative or innovative to share with you. I really feel like, you know, the, the key to success generally and in business is really execution. It's not, most of us, we understand the basic principles and we understand what we should do, but really the differentiator is how well businesses can execute. So. Uh, I just wanted to kind of share those things as kind of a, uh, a preface to a few comments that I'll make. And, and finally, uh, by way of preface uh, with us today, Mavis Knowles is, is with us and she uh, has been with our company. I actually, I actually sent a text to HR today to say, now tell me again, how long has Mavis been here? Cause she's been here so many years, I can't keep track of the numbers and they're confused. So I'm not getting a very good answer back. So I'm thinking it's 40 years. It's probably more than 40 years, um, but maybe it's 42 years. I think that's what that meant. Mavis has been with us a long time and she's certainly, uh, I think part of the success of our company are people like Mavis. So when I ask what, so what does Mavis do around here these days? My answer to that is I really don't know what Mavis does. Um, now I did know at one time but she's kind of, I think she's semi-retired is what I understand. And I think she kind of does what she wants to do, which is a lot of projects that we have around the company, 
uh, Mavis, because she's been with us so so long and knows so much, she can she can just kind of pitch in on projects, whether it be remodeling a store or other type projects that we have around here. I think her other main job is to uh, a lot of the long termers here with elders. Their job is to help keep me humble. So uh, that's 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 not a problem when Mavis is around. So uh, she she can, she's quick to tell me what my shortcomings are. So um, we all love Mavis around here. And by the way, Mavis is uh, is Kelly's mother, so uh, I should say that. All right, so Glenn submitted uh, just a, a few questions to me, and his first question was, so just give us a little bit about the story of elders. And I'll go back 102 years ago, and that is that my grandfather, I grew up in Chickamauga, Georgia. My grandfather, uh, he was the postmaster in Chickamauga, um, uh, and then he ended up opening a hardware store. My father, who is elder and for whom we named our company after he passed, um, my father was an engineer, uh, but my father came back and worked with his dad in Chickamauga for a few years, learned the business, and then came to Chattanooga with three partners, and they opened our first store in Chattanooga 51 years ago uh, in 1969. And uh, I, the, the, one of the stories I love that dad would tell about that first year, and it's something that I have a hard time relating to, is he said, at the end of the first year, we opened a store on Highway 58, for those of you who are Chattanoogans, we opened a store on Highway 58, and when we opened the store, that location was in the country. And it was on a two-lane road, which is now a five-lane road, but it was a two-lane road. Probably dad was not real sophisticated about locating retail stores, but it, it ended up working. But uh, after the first year, he, he told the story, and I think he just told the family, but he told the story that they, they lost $5,000 at that store the first year. And he said, I thought that I was going to lose $5,000 a year for the rest of my life. And that's meaningful to me because I've never been through that. Because when I came to the company, we had six stores and then we closed the store. We ended up with five, but we had, we had five stores and we, we had some degree of success at that point. So I never knew the, uh, um, uh, I, I guess the, the concern of not knowing if the business was gonna be here the next day because we had a little bit of momentum when I joined. And so I've never really known uh, what that feels like. And I really didn't sense it at home. I was, a, I was a young boy when dad and his partners opened this store here. I will say this and then I'll move on. But um, so when he opened the store at Highway 58, my brother and sister and I and mother would come to the store before, uh, before it opened. And then once it opened, uh, on Sundays, the store was closed. Our stores are open on Sunday now, but the, the store was closed on Sunday. So we would come to the store on Sunday from Chickamauga. We still lived in Chickamauga. We would come to the store. And one of my jobs, uh, pretty sure this is child, this is a violation of child labor these days, but one of my jobs was to operate the pipe machine. And we could not buy different lengths of galvanized pipe back then. So we had to cut it ourselves and thread it. And so I was operating this piece of machinery that we wouldn't dare let a miner operate these days. But uh, I operated that and I don't know how many pieces of pipe I cut and threaded. I'm sure hundreds, if not thousands back in those days. So uh, that was my introduction to this business uh, in, those, in those early days. So, uh, well, since then, Glenn's already said uh, we're, we're at 22 stores now and we're uh, in other markets and we actually are, are planning to enter the Nashville market uh, this year. Uh, so we will continue to, uh, we'll continue to expand. So um, I, won't, I won't say any more about the history of our store uh, other than just that. I, I did want to move into really uh, Glenn's maybe uh, I'll, I'll say first question, and that is, he asked me, and I'm just going to read the question that he, that he sent me. He said, what was your father's principles of success? And then he followed that with a question that, that was, have you modified the success principles he used to grow the business? 
And so I really want to kind of answer both of those together. And by the way, Glenn, uh, once I get started talking about our business, it, 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 can, it can go on for days, right, Mavis? So just stop me when you're ready for me to stop. And if we want to ask questions or want me to answer some questions, I'm happy to do that. But, um, and one thing, Glenn, I appreciate about the questions you submitted is, and it's always helpful for me when I, when I share a few thoughts with folks, it causes me to think, it causes me to reflect on, uh, on our business. But, so what are some of the principles of success? And, uh, and I'll start with dad. And although I've, I've been fortunate to be able to have an education, a formal education, I really consider the best education um, that I ever received really came from dad and from working with dad. And a lot of people, they, they struggle working with their parents. Uh, but, for, but for me, it was, there, there was never any struggle whatsoever. Matter of fact, when I, when I started, uh, when I came here from the accounting firm, uh, dad said, you know, Tom, there's, there's one thing that we need to have this agreement between us. And he said, you know, if we ever get crossed up and we can't reconcile that, he said, you know, one of us is going to have to go. And he said, just so you're clear, that's going to be me. You don't get to leave. You're here. You have to stay. I'm going to go. So, um, so one of the things I loved about dad was his sense of humor and his humility, um, but one of the things uh, that I learned early on from dad, and it really was reinforced in the business, and that was the importance he placed on people. Okay, there's cliche number one, right? Uh, yeah, people are important. Everybody says people are important. Sure, they're important. If you were around dad very long, you really got a, a real sense for what that meant. So one of the, one of the ways that this came out in dad uh, was that he wanted to know your name. And it was, it was critically important to him. So uh, we, we uh, I, I grew up in Chickamauga, went to uh, First Baptist Church in Chickamauga. Here in Chattanooga, dad went to Brainerd Baptist, dad mother went to Brainerd Baptist Church. Dad was very active in the church. And uh, one of his roles was he was a greeter at one of the doors. And his goal was, I want to be able to speak to everybody by name who comes in my door. Now, Brandon Baptist is a fairly sizable church. This door probably had 100 people pass, in, pass through it every Sunday. And so dad was determined. And he, and, and he liked to say, I don't have a gift for knowing names. I just have a commitment for knowing your name. And so he would, I mean, we would go to Ace Hardware Conventions, and he would pull out this book and go through all these names. And, and actually, I, I embrace kind of the same thinking. I mean, he, he, you know, I learned these things from him. And so it's so powerful to be able to call somebody by their name. But that, that's not really the point. But the point is that people are important. Um, and so I think, uh, I think dad made people feel that way. And so... Um, and so that's, that's, that's a principle, I think, a principle of success is that others are important and don't, don't, assume that, don't assume that you're more important than you really are, that it's really about the other people. Um, the, uh, I think another principle of success uh, for dad was, again, this, this, uh, this idea of humility, which is, which is pretty apparent in like the uh, I think he was joking around with me. I never tested dad on that thought of getting crossed up that one of us would have to go. I really thought he would make kind of make me stay, but I didn't want to test that in case that I had to go. Uh, but but dad was, I think, truly a humble person uh, in, in spite of his success. And uh, he was he had, you know, an open door in his office and, and he was very, very uh, appro approachable. You know, one of the things about dad uh, in terms of that, that element of humility is that he was very comfortable with letting other people lead. And so, and, and what that did for me was I was never second guessed in our business. And very early on, I became president of the company and uh, I, I never was second guessed. And I'm sure he probably sometimes felt like this was pro this is probably a mistake, but I'm not going to second guess you on it. And my takeaway from that was a principle of success is that you have to build confidence in the people that you work with. And you do that by preparing them and equipping them, 
but also not second guessing them and letting them make mistakes sometimes and not saying, I told you so. And so dad was really the embodiment uh, of that. Um, so let me kind of transition just a little bit into, so how have we modified that success, uh, those principles of success? I don't know that we have, I think we've built on them, um, but dad, dad had a lot of charisma. And I really think the early years were almost built on, now he did have three partners, but dad was the president and the leader from day one. And I think a lot of his success was built on his personal charisma and, and those things about caring for others and understanding the importance of others and building the confidence of others and those type things. But I really think that charisma uh, got us a long ways. And he hired some really good people early on. Mavis is an example of that. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the interesting things for me in this company is to see the growth of our company and the stages that we've been through and the difficulty of charisma won't carry us anymore. Uh, I don't have the charisma that my dad had, so uh, it wouldn't work anyway. But fortunately, we don't have to rely on that. What we do have to rely on is with a larger organization, uh, we have to be very disciplined around how we communicate. We have to be disciplined around what are our values? What is our mission? It has to be very clear uh, for our people. I'm gonna see if I can do this. Uh, I think I can, let's see. Hang on with me just one second. There we go. Um, I, I know you can't read all that, but those are those are our values. And one of the things we did, I, I guess, was Dad would say uh, we professionalized the business, or we really created structure, and we created uh, uh, systems and those type things. And so uh, we we didn't we had values, we didn't have them documented. And uh, so uh, we did that a few years ago. We didn't have a mission, but we knew what it was, but, but we ended up, we documented a mission. And one of the things we do is really just try to use any kind of, we do a lot of seminars around here and a lot of communication, and we try to embed those principles in our people so that we're all on the same page. Because yeah, we've got a policy book, uh, but there's thousands of policies and nobody knows all those policies. But the main thing is we have to we have to make sure that people understand that the, the big picture items and so these values are are something that I think we were actually founded on, um, and but again and it's kind of funny you know uh, a lot of people a lot of people bring in consultants and they create these values and these mission you know a mission and you collaborate co collaborate you go offsite everybody has input etc. Well, I'll be honest with this group. I did that. I, what's that? I, I, create, I, I did those values. Uh, I did the mission statement. Yeah, I did run it by our directors and said, hey, give me some input. Is this right? You know, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't create them. Our company created them. All I did was document them. So, but we didn't go through a big fancy process or anything. I just said, I'm pretty sure this is what this is what we live by, but we've been much more intentional since actually documenting them to uh, to actually embed them uh, in our company. So I'll I'll just share one other uh, thought on principles of success, and that is the the leaders of a company have to be accountable. Okay, I know another cliche, right? We have to be accountable. I learned this years ago, uh, uh, and again, it goes—it really goes back to dad, and it goes back to we were walking through the parking lot of a store, and uh, there was a piece of trash on the ground, and uh, and dad could tell I was a little bit frustrated with it, and um, and he said he said Tom, I know you're frustrated. You want me to speak? You want me to speak to the manager about that? And I said, no, I said, you know, it's in, in, in this is the way, this is how kind of I sum this up today. And I, occasionally our people will hear me say this, and that is, how is it, and sometimes I have a little bit of an edge, but usually it's, it's to have, it's to communicate effectively. How is it that we've been in business 51 years and we can still make this mistake? 
And, uh, you know, that's, that's part of God's humbling us is to, reminding, to remind us that we're humans and we will always make mistakes. But how is it that that can happen? And I, and I, I learned years ago that it's nobody's fault but mine that this is happening. So dad told this story. I love this joke. He, he had this jo joke that he would tell. And um, I don't think he ever told it in front of big groups, but um, it, it was these, these two ace hardware retailers. They're talking to each other. And this one retailer is kind of bemoaning the fact that he has this employee that he doesn't have much regard for. And he's telling the fellow ace retailer, he's saying, I've got this employee that's just so stupid. Pardon the expression, we don't, don't typically use that word, but he's so stupid. He said, I just, you know, I am just so frustrated by him. And so the other ace retailer says, oh, okay, well, um, so who hired him? And the guy said, well, you know, I, I hired him. Okay, well, who trained him? And the ace retailer says, well, sheepishly, he says, well, I trained him. And then he said, well, who pays him? And the ace retailer said, well, I guess I pay him. And he said, who's stupid? And so really to me that the point of that is it's, a, it's accountability. The leader has to be accountable for everything. And ultimately you have control over everything. So when I say something like, after 51 years, how can we make this mistake? I'm really pointing that at myself. So how is it that we have not communicated? How is it that we have not trained? How is it that we have not enforced? How is it that we have not done those things? And, uh, and ultimately, you know, it comes back to my fault. Uh, a few years ago, I got a call uh, one, one Saturday morning from a customer that was really unhappy. Um, and I hung up that call and I was, you know, there, there's nothing that uh, I guess in a way upsets me more than a customer who's unhappy because we worked so hard to try to not let that happen. But again, God reminds us of our, our, human, our humanity. Um, so I was really so frustrated. And so I called our director of store operations, all the store managers report to him. And then I said, uh, Steve, I said, let me, I'm going to call the store manager right now. I'm going to three-way call this. And I want to share with you the telephone call that I just received. And so I, we got the store manager uh, on the call. And it really is something that should never have happened. I mean, a lot of times when a customer calls me and they're upset with our people, my first reaction is, Tom, don't say anything uh, because there's another side to this story. And usually our people use really good judgment. And usually it's, a, it's I probably shouldn't say this to this group because so, many of you may be customers or prospective customers. A lot of times the customer is wrong. And so I'm going to try to support uh, our people. But in this case, you can kind of tell after you've done this for years and years, uh, we, we, we really mess this one up. So I was on the phone, I explained to them, they probably sensed my frustration, I explained to them what had happened, and this manager did not excuse it, said, yeah, that's what happened. And I said, whose fault is this? And of course, and again, this is kind of for effect a little bit. And so there's silence on the phone, because I suspect Steve was thinking, I guess, you know, he's, he's over all the stores. And then the store manager probably was thinking, I guess I'm supposed to say it's my fault. And after a little bit of silence, that's one thing I learned years ago is let the silence rest on other people. After a little bit of silence, the store manager spoke up and he said, I guess it's my fault. Uh, and, and I said, no. It's not either of your fault, it's my fault. So how is it that our company can make this mistake, even from some of our most junior people? How is it, have, we, have I not communicated the mission? Have I not communicated the values? I mean, the answer to those questions, it was rhetorical at the time, but the answer to the questions is, the answer is no. I mean, we have 550 employees these days, but we missed, we missed something in there. And so it just kind of, you know, reinforces for me the importance of we got to figure out. I mean, we're we're not touching everybody, so we got to figure that out. Glenn, I think I'm 
I'm probably about out of time. I did want to just maybe just a couple of comments about you had asked about culture. And I will just say this, and that is that we are, in a lot of ACE retailers around the country, we are so focused on customer service. Okay, another cliche, right? Customers are number one, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, very cliche. But we, and Mavis could probably attest to this, or if she can't, I would hope she would fake it in front of a group of guests like this. But uh, we are so obsessed with uh, customer service. I, I participate, we do an orientation class for, for all new associates that we hire throughout the year, and I participate in that because I think it's important that, uh, that the president, uh, uh, they hear me speak to the importance of helpfulness uh, in our mission. A couple of things around helpfulness. One is, uh, two things. One thing that, that we say around here is when it comes to customer service, there are no policies. There is no organization that does a great job with customer service based on policies. It's based on people's judgment. And we don't have to use judgment with every customer, but occasionally when we run into sticky situations or problems or decisions when we have to make, we have to go above and beyond, we want our people to know that we want them to have the confidence, I'll go back to what I was saying earlier, to have the confidence to make a decision for our customer. And a lot of times we have to train our people, and this is one thing that we say, we have to train our people. If you rule in favor of the customer, don't think that you're ruling against the, co the company. If you're given money, if you're making a concession, think about it's a win-win. You have just ruled in favor of the company too, because we don't think of that customer as one transaction. We think of that customer long-term. This is a relationship that we have. Uh, and you see on uh, right here on the values, build relationships is one of our values, whether it's with our people or whether it's with our customer. So it's, uh, it's critically important. But when it comes to customer service, there are no policies. Get that out of your mind. We're not going to tell you what well, the policy is. We better not. Y'all please call me if one of our people says that. And you'll, I'll know that I'm not doing a good job at getting that across. There's one other thing, I'm a CPA. My brother's the CFO at our company, he's a CPA. Um, I like to tell our people this, because sometimes we think about money when we're talking, when we're thinking, when we're talking to a customer. I, this is an expression I like to use. You take care of the customer and the money will take care of itself. You don't worry about the money. You take care of the customer. If the money starts become being a problem, I can assure you there's some CPAs in the office that will let us know and we'll have to kind of recalibrate and we'll have to rethink some things. Uh, but don't worry about the money, just worry about the customer. And we, we have people that watch the numbers real carefully and, uh, and our managers do. I mean, it's not like we're um, uh, irresponsible with the money, uh, but our managers are watching that. But by and large, our line people, uh, they don't have to worry about that. One final thought on, on culture, uh, Glenn, I'll, I'll stop. And that is, I heard this several years ago, and that is um, you can put a great person in a poor culture and the culture will win every time. You know, conversely, you can put an average person or maybe, maybe even a below average person in a great culture and they will step up to that culture. And so part of, our, part of our job around here is to create a culture that, that we can hire average people that will step up to that. Because I like to say, when I talk to our leaders in the company, I like to say, you know, are, do we hire better people than Home Depot and Lowe's? And we got some great, great people. Um, but I'd like to think that, you know, we don't have an advantage in the marketplace in terms of necessarily who, we don't have an advantage or disadvantage in who we hire. But what we do have an advantage at with is the culture we have, the emphasis on people development, the emphasis on training, the emphasis on building relationships internally, the fact that uh, I try to know everybody's name in our company. Uh, now I don't, 
Uh, and I'll, let me finish with this one little secret because I want to tie back in the name thing. So I have an app on my phone these days that HR keeps current for me. It has, it has 550 photos in it and it has everybody's name and it has their start date. And so when I'm out visiting stores uh, and it's sorted by store, when I'm out visiting stores and I've let people know this, I'm not ashamed of it. When I pull into the parking lot, the first thing I do is pull out my phone and look through all the pictures and the names of the people who work in the store. And when I go in that store, I do my best, I'm not perfect at it, but I do my best to call people by name when I greet them. Again, that's that's something that, that, uh, that, uh, that dad reinforced for me, that it's, it's important. One of our values, and you see it on here too, is to stay small while growing. And to me, staying small means we don't want to be a big corporate impersonal corporation. And, and a big challenge for us is that we, as we add stores and we add people, how do we still feel small internally? And how do we feel small to our customers? And so one way that, that again, I try to do that and some of our leaders in the company do is again, I pull into the store, I look at the names and I go in. And even if it's somebody who's fairly new, I do my best to call them by name. And nowadays we've, we've enhanced the app so that when people are hired on, we've actually got hobbies listed in that same app. So I might, I might see something like, I'll go into our Hardin Valley store in Knoxville. And I know one of the young ladies there, I can see her right now, I can't tell you her name, but I guarantee you by the time I get out of my car at Hardin Valley, I will know her name. Uh, but I know, she, I know she plays volleyball at UT. And I might say something to her like, so you know, what's, what's y'all's record or so-and-so. And so that connection with our people is one way that, again, that we stay small and that we have. I do think at some point uh, we have to keep getting creative about how we keep that smallness around here. Um, but I think that's really important because when we lose the smallness, when we can't build the relationships uh, and, and like these other things, then we start losing a competitive advantage that we have. Uh, Glenn, you had several other questions, but I'm going to stop uh, out of respect for your time and the people's time. And uh, hopefully you're a very eclectic group. Hopefully I hit a few things that have some meaning. Again, it all kind of sounds like cliche, and, um, but I, I really think the secret's in the execution and, uh, and, and the secret is in the people and maintaining, keeping people like Mavis and many of our other leaders in the company that have been here a long time. But we also have a lot of young people that come in and come out. There's a, there's a certain positions in our company for that. And we love the ability to touch some of these young people and hopefully have, a, have an environment here that's, that's really healthy for them to have their first job. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you so much, Tom. What a powerful wow. lesson wow. there. Like I said, like I lessons, lessons in life and in business. And uh, I, I so often compare... Uh, the culture of Ace Hardware, Elders Ace Hardware, with that of Chick-fil-A. Both of them built on Christian principles, and they try every way they can to, to please the customer. I can remember taking a, uh, a garden sprayer in one day that wasn't working, and they said, oh, that's an Ace uh, sprayer. I said, we'll just give you a new one. And uh, I said, really? I was thinking I was going to buy a new nozzle for it or something. And uh, I said, well, you know, I've got another one in the, in the garage and it's, it's, I got the same problem. Well, bring it all back. Well, I got two new sprayers that day. Uh, I, I, anyway, I never will forget it, but I do have one complaint and uh, COVID had a little bit to do with it. I have stopped by Ace Hardware when I really didn't need something, but I would think of some little something I could buy so I could get a bag of popcorn, the best popcorn anywhere around, unless you go to the movies. In fact, I think better than the movies. Some of them are, are not keeping it fresh. They uh, pop it up in batches. And I saw one where they just dump these large bags of pre-pop popcorn in the bin. Uh, one other quick story. I had a hot water heater that went out just before Christmas, not a good time for a hot water heater to go out. My daughter was coming in from Atlanta 
So I discovered I needed a new thermostat. Well, I was across town when I finally realized what I needed to do. So I went to one of the major plumbing supply places here in town, Ferguson's, which if for plumbing, uh, they have a lot. And uh, anyway, they looked and says, you know, we don't have it, but you know where it is? It's at Ace Hardware. So they said, uh, it looks like the one on Dayton Boulevard. Well, so I called Dayton Boulevard and they said, yes, we do normally carry it, but we're out. And I said, oh my goodness. I said, do you know anywhere else I might could find it? Well, this lady and I, I'm, I knew you were going to be on the program and I promised I was going to share her name, but I, some way or another, wherever I wrote it down, I, I lost it, but she was at the Dayton Boulevard, uh, facility over in Red Bank. And, uh, anyway, she called around and she found it at one of your, uh, not one of your stores, but at Javis's, uh, Ace Hardware there in, um, Tunnel Hill, I believe. And anyway, but that's a matter of going above and beyond and trying to please the customer. And I, I, I'm, I'm notorious for going in the store here on Signal, the one in Walden, of going in and said, hey, I've got a, a doohickey here. Uh, it goes to such and such. Uh, I don't know what you call it, but do you have one? And nine times out of 10, they'll have that doohickey or whatever it is I'm looking for. Uh, Mavis, I purposely waited to recognize you. And uh, I thank you for mentioning Mavis earlier. I think that kind of gives an idea of the value that you place on employees and people. Uh, they're, they're people, they just happen to be employees. Maybe uh, CEOs go and speak at conventions and at uh, organizations and groups like this. They tell you about all their values. They tell you about the way they operate, et cetera. But I've, I've heard the statement said, you know, it's easy to talk the talk, but walking the walk's a little bit different. What's your comment on that? If you could unmute there. One thing is they have always promoted from within the company. We've trained our employees from the time they were 16 on up. Number of our present managers have been with us that long. And uh, you've watched, I've watched a number of kids grow up through Ace Hardware, stay with us, move on to their own jobs after college. Uh, my own kids and my granddaughter has worked with Ace. So it's, it, it can be a family business. Uh, we've had a number of employees meet and marry and still working for Ace Hardware. And they work with you, with your family. Um, I've started part-time, worked my way up to manager into uh, merchandising part-time. I've had time off with my husband and his illness for a period of time other companies would not allow. So you don't only learn to do the hardware to take care of the customers, but they also take care of their employees. Are they perfect at everything? No, who is? But um, after going on to 42 years, I can't say that um, I wouldn't recommend Ace Hardware for anybody to work at or shop at or meet most of the employees that we work for. A lot of them, like Tom says, we got so many of them anymore, I don't know. I used to know all of them because I'm in and out of most of the stores most of the year, I'm in and out of most of them at any time, but uh, it's hard to keep up with that many people anymore, but it's a good business. They're family oriented, they're customer oriented. They help with educations. They are, um, I don't know, it's family to me. Thank you so much, Mavis. Bob Ritchie, I owe you an apology. Uh, I think most everyone knows about you. You're uh, there in the, I believe you're in Franklin, Tennessee, aren't you? No, I'm in Mount Juliet. That's the Mount other Juliet. side. Okay. That's, All right. My, my, that's the I, side I that's not near any water. Tennessee. <laughs> anyway, so since I overlooked you, uh, maybe you would like to kind of kick the mastermind off. Maybe you have a comment uh, on something that Tom or Mavis shared, or maybe you have a question for them. 
Yes, I have a, I have a big question. Uh, like I said, I live in Mount Juliet. Uh, we have had two Ace Hardware stores come and gone, and a good majority of them in the Nashville market area have closed down. I don't attribute that all to the big box stores uh, because like you said, customer service, you don't get sometimes a customer service or the interest. Uh, they'll tell you where something is at the big box stores, but you know they don't go beyond trying to help you out or anything. So what do you see as the biggest issue uh, to both uh, Mavis and Tom, the biggest issue as far as all these stores coming and going. I mean, Mount Juliet, when we moved here, we had 3,000 people. Right now, we have 30,000 people in uh, the years that we've lived here, which ought to be more than enough to support an Ace Hardware store, but yet we can't keep them in town. I would say customer service and being there with the merchandise that they need. We've taken over some stores that weren't producing like they should. And a lot of time is due to the fact that the merchandise wasn't there. They didn't have enough employees. The employees weren't trained to handle the customers or to know what the, the inventory was for. I mean, you got to learn a little bit about plumbing, electrical, cutting glass pipe, as Tom said. At one time we used to flare tubing and there's, you've got to train your people and you got to let them know that they're there to take care of that customer. Tom? Uh, yeah. Bob, it's it's pretty ironic. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that probably I'd be I probably shouldn't say. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that we are looking at the Nashville market right now. I think we're about this close to signing a lease on a building in East Nashville. Uh, but the other two markets that we're looking at right now are Murfreesboro and Mount Juliet, uh, and uh, yes, I, there are A stores that fail. Um, there are 5,400 A stores around the world right now, most of them in the United States. Uh, I, I hesitate to say it this way, but for, uh, yes, helpfulness is really important. Customer service is critical. Uh, but there are, there there's a lot of detail behind operation, as Mavis said, keeping product in stock, understanding the mix, uh, and, and really uh, complementing the hardware with some strong niches. Two of the strongest niches we have these days are the nursery and live goods, and we have a great uh, team of people who really understand the sourcing and the mix. We don't, every store doesn't have is not equipped to have that nursery component, but our, our newest stores, uh, it's, it's a strong niche. And another niche is Home and Gift. And uh, we have a model in the Knoxville market that is extraordinarily powerful. You put those things together and you put together some exclusive brands that the big boxes don't have, and you wrap that in helpfulness and you have to have the capital. You know, I said earlier, you take care of the customer and the money will take care of itself. You have to have capital. And a lot of times these stores that fail, they don't have the capital. They don't have the staying power. Uh, they, they hit a little bit of a tough patch and they don't have the capital to survive. And ACE does not prop you up when that happens. Uh, so a lot of times the most successful operators have multiple stores like we do. We're one of ACE's largest operators. Uh, and so, um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping, Bob, that we can find a piece of property uh, that we can afford in Mount Juliet, and we want to build a building the way that uh, uh, sometimes we take spaces that exist, but you always compromise on those a little bit with the facility, but we want to build the right thing in Murfreesboro and in Mount Juliet, or I'm going to say Mount Juliet slash Hermitage, because uh, we don't know exactly where on that I think that's Highway 70 on that corridor. We would we would place ourselves, but uh, but anyway. So uh, uh, I haven't asked the bank to help fund that uh, yet, but uh, but we are looking uh, actively at the in that Mount Juliet area. Well, Donaldson has a pretty active and good uh, Ace Hardware. Uh, that's one of the few ones that have, are left in the area. Yes. Uh, which they pretty much serve a lot of the Hermitage area. 
Yes. And, and that, but we, we've got a, a Lowe's now, a big box store. It's up in a shopping center area. But that was one of the things right now, one of the uh, former A stores, one of the things value added that they have, they did repairs to like small lawnmowers, uh, chainsaws and things like that. And so there was a, I mean, a lot of times we went there for that and then ended up buying something out of the store. So that was, to, to me, was a good combination because you don't see uh, that kind of combination and, and everything. And of course, the, you know, you, most of them carry parts for the lawnmowers and everything, but they, half the time, they can't tell you which one works with what. Uh, yeah. So I thought that was, uh, the other the other Ace Hardware store is now a, a 1440 health fitness place. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so... Yeah, you, you know, uh, power equipment is a is a very we're we're very good at power equipment. I, not me personally, but our people are very good at it. We have a great brand in the steel power equipment. Uh, we're really good at losing money in our small engine shops. Uh, I, I I tell you, if our people will take care of the customer, we'll take we'll make sure the money takes care of itself. We are working hard on the on those small engine shops. You you won't see it. Not only, not only the fact that we don't make money or we lose money there, but also that our service is not as good as we would like. We don't have the turnaround as quick as we would like. So we're putting a lot of emphasis on that because we do understand it's a differentiator. We also understand, Bob, I'll say this, and that is we have a lot of different competitors from the big boxes who we've, we've been competing with them for what, 40 years, um, Amazon, Walmart, uh, whoever. One of the things that, that we are we debate internally some is, you know, we are guilty um, of not charging what we should charge for services. Uh, and whereas Amazon picks off a little bit of our product sales uh, for the things that we do that Amazon can't do, we need to make sure we get a fair price for those. And, uh, and, and I think small engine repair is something that we probably too often, we do it to no charge. And, and so we, we need to tighten up our operation there. I mean, we, you have to, the market requires you to be competitive from a price standpoint. I mean, can you be a little higher on some things? Yeah, but you can't be much. I mean, you've got to be competitive, whether, it, whether it's with Home Depot and Lowe's, whether it's Amazon. But for things that only we do, we have to we have to get the fair price for that, and we don't need customers buying on Amazon. I don't have an attitude about this because you know the market's the market, and customers are going to make the best decisions for them. But we, you know, it's if if customers buy a product on Amazon and come to us for services that we don't make money at, that obviously doesn't work for us long term. And so yes, it is true, Bob, that if if customers come to us for the service and if we do it, our job that hopefully they'll buy other things from us. We fortunately have a strong business and it's not been a problem for us, but we just need to make sure that the service side of our business is that we don't give that away too much and that we ask a fair price, but it has to be fair. It can't be, can't be more than fair um, to us. So anyway, but uh, it's, a chat, that chat, it's a challenge that small engine repair is, but it's a differentiator. So we, we'll keep doing it. Did I suck all the energy out of the room with that? No, sorry about that. Glenn, Glenn, you're on mute. You're on mute. Hey, Glenn, you're still on mute. You. My bad. I was telling Liz she needed to unmute. <laughs> So my bad, but I was saying that, you know, as an educator, you might look at this a little bit differently. They don't teach this stuff in school. I wish they did. Uh, so as an educator, what have you got to say? Uh, what are your thoughts on some of the things that have been shared today? I think this has been eye opening because from my perspective, this is what's missing right now in college education. So we go through our textbooks, we hit these perfect scenarios, and we don't discuss these intangibles. And so as I was sitting here, the just to stay small while growing, 
I think um, on college campus right now, there's a longing to be connected. And so that really hit home, but we're not really instilling in our students practical ways to do this. So instead we're, you know, economic supply and demand or sports psychology, you know, exercise is good for you, but we're not thinking about these intangible. And so from my point of view, it's just providing opportunities for students to listen to individuals who have experience in the real world instead of professors who are lecturing from a textbook. So this has been really informative. And I think it's just allowing students to get connected with individuals with real real world experience would be incredibly helpful just in higher education in general. I, I think you're dead on there. And I think one of the changes that we're going to see, uh, the higher learning institutions are struggling like they've never struggled before because of COVID. And all of the information that's available online, that's free. Uh, so in, in some ways, yes, there's that value in having that uh, diploma. Some many uh, employers require some degree of education, but more and more people are starting businesses on their own online businesses and whatever and they're teaching and learning things such as we learn in chattanooga self-improvement meetup that tom and mavis have shared with us today so uh i, I think that probably uh, higher institutions of learning are going to need to maybe make some changes along the way if if they're going to sustain where they are. Uh, growth is probably the furthest thing from their mind. It's a matter of holding on to what you had. Uh, so if you want to comment, point, Glenn. Maurice, yeah. Uh, when you say holding on to what you have, and Tom, I've visited uh, your stores, and I really like the, the balance in terms of the space that's there and the people that accommodate you when you come in. And I'm looking at the, the feeder system. Uh, they don't teach shop in schools, pretty much. But there's no reason why you can't go into the schools occasionally and tell people, do you, do you understand or do you know what happens at a hardware store? Here's a whole nother world. They have experience with going to the mall. But most young people don't have the experience of going to a hardware store. So if there's a way to kind of uh, like um salt prime to pump so that young people have an idea you know this is a great place it takes you a quarter or less of the time to shop in a hardware store than it does in the big box store so this is a fun place where you can come and glenn you can also get popcorn pretty soon <laughs> well you, you hopefully we'll see popcorn returning if we can get rid of uh covid I, well, I, I'll, I'll say this, Glenn, and that is that as much as we hated to see popcorn kind of go away, it did. It is saving us fifty thousand dollars a year. So uh, no, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing the uh, the line item for popcorn. But it's it's one of those intangibles, uh, Liz, that you were talking about. It's one of those intangibles that we feel like it's important that we that we what? that we what? offer. Oh, and I'll say this to our associates. Don't miss cleaning that popcorn machine on a daily basis either. Apparently, it's one of the dirtiest jobs in the store. I've cleaned bathrooms, but I've never cleaned a popcorn machine. I think I will retire having not cleaned a popcorn machine. So I'm not. I'm not going to try to do that one. Well, as a consumer, I, I, anytime I ever mention Ace Hardware, that is one of the first things that is mentioned. So with all the money that's spent on advertising, uh, even though it may be a little bit of the pain in the rear. And at 50,000, but when you look at, for all the stores uh, advertising, it's, it's kind of minute probably when you look at total sales, but yet, yes, I, I know you have to look at the bottom line, but I hope it'll return one day. Folks, our time's getting by real fast, which it always does. Who's got a burning desire to ask a question rather than me calling on you? Just jump in. We're not bashful here. Molly? Do Yes, Tom. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was it was wonderful. Um, and coming back to basics is so important. I also want to let you know that my experience of ACE fits in with your values. Um, going 
into ACE confused about something or other that I'm fixing or trying to figure out. And I'm always, always every single time I've been treated with respect and I've left feeling in a better mood than when I went in. Like, oh, what am I going to do about this? And it's just been beautiful. I'm curious how you train or your managers and train your employees to deliver such extra compassion when they're doing their job. Uh, well, well, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I think it's just, and, and I hate to be cliche, but uh, we're very, very intentional about that. Mm -hmm. Like I say, we try to untrain people. We try to untrain them from protecting the company. You take, you focus on the customer and, and a lot of people, they're loyal to the company. They want to, they want to protect the company. They don't want to give you a refund. They don't want, they, they want to treat you suspiciously if you're asking something extra. And we, we try to untrain that from them. And again, we, one thing that we do, and I learned this from uh, years ago uh, from Ritz Carlton, is that every week our stores, we have huddles every day. And every week we are talking about across the 22 stores, we're talking about the same topic. Now we have some different topics store specific, but there's one theme for the week. And we go through these, the values, uh, there. <laughs> uh, uh, each, uh, so we got 52 weeks in the year. We, we, we'll go, we'll cycle through the values twice. So we'll talk about the value of honoring God during the first half of the year. Once one week, we'll be talking about that. And during the second half, and by the way, I should say this too. And that is that, you know, um, Honoring God is not about, uh, obviously, we, we, we couldn't even if we wanted to. We, we don't hire people based on what they believe. We don't promote them based on what they believe and you know, that kind of thing. But that is a foundational value. A lot of us share values. When I think of honoring God as a Christian, I think a lot of people who may be atheists, they share a lot of the values. I think of it as honoring God. They think of it as being a good person, however we think about that. Um, but we, but we cycle through these messages. So we're constantly reinforcing the values. Uh, we have, we have a list of 10, what we call elders empathy. And it's, it's, it's situations in the store to recognize that there are icons in the store that are, you're, you as a customer are not, it's not, you're not supposed to understand those icons, but it's to remind our people, for example, we have an icon that has, frankly, an elderly person stooped over with a cane. And that is reminding our people as they see those icons that when an elderly person comes in, maybe there needs to be a little extra care. Maybe we need to go to the shelf for them and we need to bring something back to them. We don't, we, we need to be sensitive to that. There's an icon that, that shows um, a, a couple with a child and the idea is that child is, is, it's hard to shop with small children and so be sensitive to that. So we are constantly going through those messages again to this week. I can't tell you what the topic is this week, but we're talking about something very specific. Uh, this I think this week is the washer, not the faucet. What does that mean? That means when the customer needs to repair their faucet, they need a washer. Your job is to help them with a 15 cent washer. Your job is not to sell them a $50 faucet. And so we want to reinforce that principle. Again, think long-term, think about one of the values, building of the relationships, think about that. The customers will come back, that'll take care of itself. We don't sell. Another thing we say around here, your job is not to sell, your job is to help. It is not to sell, we are not salespeople. We are here to help. And so, and we constantly reinforce. So we're constantly reinforced those messages. My grandmother was a high school English teacher. I'm very, and we are very intent about our language. We love creating phrases that only we understand. I love it when I'm at a store and somebody will say something about, you know, uh, uh, we, we sold them the washer, not the faucet. Oh, I'm saying, oh, it's working. These people are getting it. 
um, and when they use our jargon, when they use our language. So that's part of that culture. I think language is an important piece of culture. Uh, so we're constantly, we're reinforcing it. We're using huddles, we're communicating. Um, you know, I attend most every meeting in the company and, and particularly with younger people or newer people. So uh, it's just, it's just being intent. It's just, it's just, it's just focus. It's an obsession. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Golly, our time has run out. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for all that you've shared with us. I, I call this sharing from the heart, sharing your true values, which are a reflection of what's in your heart, kind of instilled by your father and uh, a great institution that he caused you to spend a lot of time with over there at Brainerd Baptist, I think. So, Folks, it's uh, a pleasure to be with you. I'm honored to be here and to facilitate such a wonderful group of people. I learned from each and every one of you. And hopefully today is another example of what we say when we listen, we ask questions, we comment and learn in an effort to help each of us to become the best version of ourselves, thus helping to make the world a better place in which to live. And if you'd like to learn more about Change Your World, go into changeyourworld.com or contact me if you're interested in participating in that. And remember, your day will be just as good as you visualized it. <laughs>